right. Father, we just want to bless your name for being so gracious and merciful unto us. My Father, my God, I decrease and I ask that you will increase through me. I just bind every spirit of entertainment or exaggeration. I pray, Father God, that I will not stand here with the enticing words of men's wisdom. I pray, Father God, for the Holy Spirit to speak through me, Father God, only that which you want your children to hear will I remember. I pray, Lord, that you will remind me only that which you want to be delivered, O oh God, today. May the entrance of your word bring light and understanding into us all today, Father God. May the word that you will speak to us today from the throne of grace bring clarity for us all in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, just have your way and do what you know how to do best through me in Jesus' name. Amen. Philippians chapter 3 from verse 15 to 20. I just want to read that quickly before we do anything. And I read Philippians from uh, chapter 3 uh, verse 15 to 20. I read using the King James Version this morning. And um, it said, let us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Verse 17, brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have also for an example. 18. If you have your Bible, underline this and read the whole uh, chapter 3, or if not the whole book of Philippians this week. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. 19. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. But our conversation is in heaven, from hence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Many work, even as I have told you, weapon, and that they are what? The enemies of the cross of Christ. Whose God is their belly. <laughs> Enemies of the cross, the friends of Jesus. And going back again to two weeks ago and three weeks and looking at the parable and the story that Jesus gave about the greedy, selfish man. And we looked at the man who came to Jesus and said, will you tell my brother, can you use your influence to influence this decision so that my brother can give me more of our father's inheritance? And Jesus said, beware of covetousness, that a man's life does not consist of the abundance of what he has. He said, beware of greed. Now there are a lot of us in the church, Christians and church-going folks, who are friends with Jesus. Because at the name and the mention of the name Jesus, every knee will bow. At the mention of the name Jesus, my needs are provided. And that is where their relationship with Jesus stops. They are in need for what they can get for themselves. No more, no less. And so when things are not going the way they want or the way they plan or perceive, then all hell will begin to break loose in and around them. 
And so Paul says, I say this to you, even with weeping and crying in my heart, that many that I have met are enemies of the cross. And he began to tell us why. He said, what? Whose God is their belly? And there is no way you can work and attain godly, Holy Spirit perfection if you mind earthly things. If you become too earthly and become more of heavenly, useless, like they say. And I was thinking about something this morning. And lately, too, I know we don't have that too much of a problem here, but I know that one thing that we deal with so much is our enemies. We like to pray that our enemies will die and God will kill all our enemies and, and destroy them out of the face of the earth. And I, I was thinking about it and I said, oh, Father Lord, I think we, the church, have become more of spiritual terrorists. Amen. We just want to kill everybody out of the way. When they don't agree with us, we want to... And so we, there's, no, <laughs> there's still much difference between us, you know what I mean? And we forget, too, that Jesus died for these guys, too. Amen. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? We want everybody dead. We want Jesus. And so we try to allow, we are trying to force God's hand to commit spiritual holocaust. Because if he kills everybody, who is going to be left on earth here? And we also forget too that we were once enemies of God. What if God has answered the prayer of the one we offended before we got to know Jesus. Did you ever think about that? Because nobody here seated before me here was born again from his mother's womb. And maybe some had. I wasn't. Amen. Nobody came into this world born again and knew Jesus Christ. And so one, at one point in time, the Bible said we were all enemies of God. At one point in time. So when you were enemies of God and you offended somebody who knew God and that person was praying that God should deal with you. If God has answered that prayer, you wouldn't be here today. Neither will I be here. Right? And so when we pray and begin to ask God, and I began to think about it. We want God to kill everybody, and we want to live forever. Amen. And I thought about something. This is, I'm not saying the Holy Spirit told me this, but I began to think, I said, okay, maybe we may die, Christians will die before their enemies. This is my thinking. You know why? This is what I want to say. I'm saying this to come to something here. The Bible says in Isaiah 57, it said the righteous are taken to spare them, right? <laughs> the grief. And so, and God, the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 23, that God does not take pleasure in the death of a sinner, right? In 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says he will want everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of God. And so, if I am saved, and I'm turning to become a spiritual terrorist, the Lord may take me to heaven on time and give the other guy time enough to repent. And so maybe my prayer actually may not actually take my enemy out. It may take me out of the way so that the enemy too can repent and get to know God like I know God. This is what I'm thinking. I'm not saying God said. I'm not saying God told me, but I was thinking about it. And I said, okay, why would we? Because we mind earthly things too much. We are so earthly. We are so earthly minded. And we have lost focus of the mind of Christ. The Bible said, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. God died for all. For God so loved the world that he gave what? His only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him, Whosoever, not some. And so instead of me praying for my enemy's death, why don't I start praying for his salvation? Because he would do me more good if he's saved. 
Because then he stopped being my enemy. And then we have gained double. A amen. So if my enemy gets saved, he will repent, and then he becomes a wonderful man, and he can actually end up becoming my best friend. And so we've gained all. And so I think that because of wrong focus, wrong teaching, wrong understanding, because we have, in our own ignorance, become the enemies of the cross of Christ. Because we don't know what the cross stood for. The cross came, Jesus died, so that all would be saved. But because we mind earthly things too much, because our God has become our belly, because the enemy is standing between me and what I want so much, But why am I saying all that? Because God is calling us into a life of perfection. And to be perfect, you cannot be earthly. To be perfect means you have to go beyond the natural into the realm of the supernatural because we are all spiritual beings having an earthly experience here. And it is that perfection that gives me the ability to love the unlovable. That is perfection. And so the Bible says what? Verse 15. Courage, can you put that scripture back again? Uh, fish, uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 15. This is what we got. I'm just I'm getting somewhere this morning briefly. And it says what? He said, let us therefore as many as be perfect. The word perfect there also means mature. <laughs> as many as what as are matured in the Lord that are no more earthly, whose God is no longer their belly, who is not talking about this here and now alone. Our focus, our preaching, our prayers is all about here and now. And because we've lost sight of the mind of God and the purpose of God. And this is why we misunderstand the word perfect. And God is calling us into a life of true perfection in Christ. And I think about it and I'll throw this out to you and I'll say it to you again. I want to give you a challenge before I go any further as the Lord brings that to my mind. I see it reminds me again and I'll say this so that I don't let it go. I want you, this is Christmas coming, right? I want to ask you a question now. What is Christmas about? Don't be afraid. Answer me. Jesus. We want to celebrate Jesus' birthday. Now, when you celebrate somebody's birthday, what do you do? You give them a gift. Huh? Am I right? If I, want, if I invite you to my birthday, you better come with something. That is the truth. You come in and look at me and say, happy birthday. And I'm like, okay, what is this guy? Why did you come? Jesus' birthday is coming. And we are getting ready for it. What will be the greatest gift to Jesus? A soul. Give Jesus a gift of a soul this year. Make it your mission. The Bible says, he that winneth so is wise. Make it a mission this year, before the end of this year, and say, Lord, we, we prophesy the end the year will end well. He will crown the year with fatness. Let him crown the year, crown the year with the fatness of heaven. Give God something this year. Don't ask God to give you anything this year. Don't pray and say, God, I want you to bless me this year. Let this year end well. Yes, it will end well. But why don't we make it a mission and say, this year, I want to do something for heaven. And the only thing you will do for heaven that will make an impact the Bible said there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repents and turns to God. There is no joy in heaven over my new truck or your big house that you just bought. You can celebrate your job. You can celebrate your healing. Heaven does not rejoice over that. Those are just supernatural addition for being a child of the kingdom. 
It's not an issue with heaven to give you. Jesus said, it is the Father's good pleasure to give to you. So let us do something as matured Christians this year and say, Lord, I want to give you a gift. And pray, God, give me the strength to present a gift on the altar, a gift of a soul for the Lord this year. What is perfection? You say, as many as be perfect. As many as be matured. I'm talking to matured people. To be perfect means to bring to final form or to strive to improve upon or to refine through deliberate and conscious effort and choice. So you're not sitting back, whining every day, no, oh, God has not done this for me. God has not done this. Oh, God has not done this. It's good. And I read something, and I wrote something I didn't know where I saw it, but I thought about it this morning too, that every time we go to God to pray, all we pray is about God change my circumstances. God bless me. God give me this. But have we ever taken time to fast and pray for God to change our character and attitude? That is perfection. That is maturity. When you stop minding earthly things, and when your focus becomes heaven bound, and I was saying it, I said it the other day, I will say it again. One thing about the gators, I may be wrong, one of the things that I love about them, you know, you see these people living to be 190 something years old, and they want to go to heaven. And God said, no, don't come. And those of us who want to stay on earth here, God is calling us home quickly. <laughs> you see how the reverse is. Jesus said, those who love their life, what? Will lose it. <laughs> and so because of our wrong focus and wrong priority, because of lack of maturity, that is what creates this chaos in our lives. So God is calling us into a place of perfection. And two Sundays ago, we talked about, you know, being able to, for us to be able to experience true conviction. We must experience true conviction of sin. That is what leads to, to the maturity as a child of God. And God is not looking for a way to rehabilitate us. God wants to create a new man out of the old. So the Bible said, if any man be in Christ Jesus, behold, is a new creature, a new specimen, a new species. That word creature, that, that which has never existed before. I'm a brand new man. And so it's only matured Christians Perfect Christians, when, he's, when you hear the word perfect, it talks about maturity. And so if you read some translation, if you read the uh, ESV and other translation of the Bible, they will use that word and they change it to maturity. Talking about the same thing. Because only matured Christians understand the concept of sacrifice. Because when you talk about the cross, the cross talks about sacrifice. It talks about denial. It talks about dying to the things and the desires of this world. Not many wants to do that. Not many are ready to do that. I don't know if you read the... How many of you have the daily bread? Do you read, uh, you read uh, yesterday's daily bread? The story of the pig and the chicken, right? And I don't know, it's the fox tail and the chicken. And the chicken came to his friend, the pig, and he said, let us open a restaurant where we'll be hard serving work, ham and eggs. How many of you know the old tale? Uh, <laughs> is that not crazy? Right? And I read that. That was the first time I'm reading that story. And the chicken came to his friend and said, let us start a food restaurant where we'll be serving ham and eggs. And so the pig turns to the chicken and he said, for you, it's just what? <laughs> it's nothing. But for me, it's a commitment. <laughs> right? <laughs> mm? <laughs> 
Because for, the, for them to serve the ham, what happened? The pig has to die. Amen. <laughs> but for the chicken, his egg doesn't cost him nothing. I just had to just, just to bend down and boom, it comes, comes out. And he's still going about his business. He doesn't lose, he doesn't lose nothing. Right? And so the, the choice in the kingdom of God is that, are you a pig or a chicken? In terms of that. Are you committed? Only matured people lay down their life for the cause they believe in. To deny yourself simply means this. Listen to me. To deny yourself means to willingly give up your right. Not by coercion, not by manipulation, not by trickery. To willingly, knowingly say this it's just like this is jacket I'm wearing or suit or whatever you want to call it. This is mine, right? I like it. I need it. Now, for me to willingly take it off my back in this cold, I'm outside and it's cold, I need to keep warm too. Nobody asks me. And I willingly give up this without anybody asking me because I saw this man in need. I give up my right so that he can have a life. That is what it means to deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow me daily. Have you ever come to that point of maturity? And so there are things that I do, even though because this world today is full of selfishness and greed. It's all about me. It's all about feeling what I want. And God is no longer what I want, but what God wants. That is perfection. That is maturity. To be mature or perfect is to have complete, mature people means having complete natural growth and development. Are you developing as a child of God? Are you growing since you got, gave yourself to Christ Jesus? John chapter 14 verse 30 says, Therefore, hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh, what am I saying? And find nothing against me. Now, perfection is this different from being faultless or flawless. Now, when we talk about the difference between being perfect and being flawless is one of the problems that we have. Right? So when we talk at church and we say, oh, nobody is perfect. Nobody can be perfect. And we use that as an excuse to be you know, for our rascality, let me use the word, in the body of Christ. You know what I mean? Nobody is perfect. Nobody can be perfect. No, no, we can be perfect. The only thing that we can never be is faultless or flawless. Only Jesus is flawless and faultless. So he said, the prince of this world cometh and finds what? Nothing in me. To be flawless simply means without fault, without blemish, without imperfection. Only Jesus is the sinless son of God. That is not what God is asking of us. Right? God wants us to come to a full place of maturity. And because the same way we confuse perfect and flawless... We confuse statues and status. Amen. Let me explain that. Right? The stature has to do with that. that pro yeah, thank you for putting out the wall there. <laughs> and so because you begin to say, okay, what is the same, the same thing? The statues have to do what? Growing and developing spiritually in the image and the nature of Christ. Just like we describe it as a natural height of a person in position upright, working and all that, but developing. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto perfect man and unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Coming into that place of perfection, of stature. That has nothing to do with my status, my title. That's what it means. Being a pastor does not make you 
mature. Being a deacon in the church does not mean you are mature. It doesn't mean you have attained that stature of, of, of the fullness of Christ. Uh, being an elder in the church does not mean you automatic. You can have a status without a good stature spiritually. Does that make sense now? Am I communicating? Does that, does that, am I confusing you? Amen? You guys are quiet this morning. Are we communicating? Yes. Yes. Uh, is it making sense at all? Yes. Talk to me, please. I don't want to get everybody all messed up this morning. Amen. 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 Now, so we're coming to that place. So we mistake. So there are three words there that we keep misinterpreting and using it to misdirect our life and confuse people. What? Perfection and flawlessness. Statues and status, character and manners. They are all, they are, and they are not one and the same. You can have a good public manners and have a very terrible character privately. Am I right? Huh? And so we, because of our immaturity, because we have not come to that full mature statues of Christ. And because we are so earthly, Jesus speaking one time, he says, stop judging by mere appearance. Stop and make what? A right judgment. So we are carried around and carried about by every wings of doctrine. And we see people, we judge them by the way they look. We judge them by the, how big their church is and how big their truck is and how big their houses are and how much grammar they can speak and how eloquent they are. They may have this wonderful manners, but terrible character. And this is what God is looking at. And this is where God is calling us into a place of what? Perfection in him. Because when people are not perfect and they are, they are not matured in Christ, then they live a life of duplicity, double standard. So they are one thing here today, another thing there tomorrow. And then we keep sending the wrong signal in the world today. And God is calling us into the place of maturity. You cannot continue to be a baby forever. So stop being deceived when somebody tells you you can't be perfect. They are telling you, they are setting you up for failure. God expects it from you. Jesus said, be thou perfect even as your heavenly father is. Amen. Amen. So God is calling us into that place of strong maturity. Paul said, when I was a child, I taught and speak and did things like a child, but now I am a man. When are you going to grow up? Growing up simply means being matured and the ability to say no to every want and desire. Amen. It's not whatever your eye see, your eye wants. And you want to get it. And so we have a lot of uh, big Christians today, even though they have the status, they can be a uh, deacon in the church, they can be carrying the title of a bishop, an elder in the church, but they are still little kids. How do you know? Because you know how you go to the store with your little baby and your boys, and they want a toy, and they don't get it, what happened? They begin to create a scene. Amen. How do, you know, they create a scene, and you know, they go throw a tantrum. And a lot of us are like that with God. When we don't get what we want today, I prayed and God didn't give it to me. What happened? Uh, hell will break loose. Right? My house become toxic. Nobody can stand around me because I begin to put up an attitude. Because I have not attained to that place of growth and maturity. The word mature also comes from nature. And if you read the Bible in the book of Romans chapter 3 verse 30, 23, that is a very interesting scripture. The Bible said, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The word there, glory there, means in all other trans literal meaning means the true nature of God. 
That glory there has nothing to do with the Shekinah glory that appeared over the tabernacle or over the head of Moses and the mountain of transfiguration. He's talking about the nature of God. For all have fallen short of the nature of God, the character of God, the character, what makes up the, 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 the God-likeness in us. And because sin came and made us fall short of that glory, God came to restore us to that nature. The nature of God that creates perfection in us. God is calling us into a place of growth that we cannot continue to be babies for how long? When are we going to grow up? When are we going to stop minding earthly things? When will heaven look at me and you and begin to say, I rejoice over my son and my daughter, and this is my son in whom I am well pleased? Where is that maturity? When is it going to happen? God is calling us to that place. And Paul said, What? I say this to you, even with tears in my eyes, weeping that many are at the enemies of the cross of Christ. Because we are so engrossed with the things of this world. Like Paul says, ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of truth. God is calling us to grow up. It cannot be the same, same old, same old year after year. The church is not a place to entertain you and me. It's a place where God has called us to mature and to grow. Now what I was yesterday, I should be better than what I was yesterday. I cannot be the same man that I was two years ago, three years ago. If we keep saying the same thing about you, Five years after you get born, you got born again, then there is a problem there. Am I, am I saying something here? You know what I mean? If we keep talking about the same issue, if we keep going around the same mountain, then you have not truly experienced true conversion. I'm sorry to say. You may have had a church experience, but you have not had a God encounter yet. And this is where God is calling us to the altar. A place to sacrifice where the flesh would die. The old man dies and the new man lives. This is what faith is all about. That Paul speaks about in Galatians chapter, 20, chapter 2 verse 20. He said, it's no longer I that live it, but Christ that lives in me. The life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who died for me. In Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible says Moses refuses to be identified with the children of Egypt, refuses to compromise and into sin in Hebrew chapter 11 from verse 26. It says Moses refused to be part of the Egyptian system and rather chosen, that is maturity. A matured Christian would choose suffering over pleasure. Amen. You see the difference? A mature child of God would choose suffering in place of pleasure. So the Bible says Moses, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the children of Israel than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. And the reason being what? Because he could see him who was invincible. That is faith. It takes faith to see that which is not visible. So the things we name it and claim it by faith is not of faith. Faith is the ability to live like the Christ you have not yet seen. Moses had not seen him, but he saw him. And so he was able to say no to unrighteousness, no to the pleasures of sin, no to the desires of this earthly system. And now what? I continued strong. I love Hebrews chapter 11. He continued strong because he could see him that was invincible. Have you seen Jesus? You've been in church for 20 years, 30 years, 5 years, 6 months. Have you met with Jesus? 
And until you meet with Jesus, you will continue to struggle and remain in the realm of immaturity and you continue to justify your weaknesses and your lives and say, this is the way I am. This is the way life is. Nobody can be perfect. That is the life from the pit of hell. You cannot be faultless, but you can be perfect. Perfect is what? Straining to become like Jesus. And so the Bible said the righteous man falleth seven times. What happened? Yet it will rise again. It doesn't mean you're not going to fall. It doesn't mean you're not going to make mistakes. But you don't stay there. And so what we're talking about, a perfect man has killed the sin nature. It is not the mistake we're talking about. It is the nature of sin that needs to die. And that can only happen when you have met with Jesus. You can meet with church, the traditions of the church, and remain the way you are. You can come in here. And that's why I tell you it's a crime to look into your pocket when we have not been able to see into your heart. Misplaced priority. God is more interested in your heart than in your pocket. He wants you to make heaven, eternity, also of great importance to you and to me. It's appointed unto man to die once. After that comes judgment. Eternity is real. Heaven is real. It is not God's will for any to perish but that all will come to know him. Jesus prayed that they might know you as the only true God in John chapter 17 and Christ Jesus whom you have sent. Our mission is to be a reflection of the glory of Christ so that men can come to know him. A mature Christian this season will begin to reach out to the unsaved. A mature Christian does not condemn. A mature Christian will love because he knows the magnitude and the depth of sin and destruction and the damage it can cause in the life of a man. So he's going to do everything within his power to make sure that that child, that brother, that sister, that friend is saved. This is what the kingdom of God is all about. This is what maturity, mature Christians do. Mature Christians don't go around becoming spiritual terrorists, killing all their enemies. Amen. Don't send everybody to hell. You are happy. Let them die. If they die, they go to hell. Are you happy? Why will you rejoice that somebody, a human being, have you ever been burnt by fire, literally, and you wish that even for your enemy? That is not sense of maturity. That is a child speaking. I realize that. Only children are happy when their friends fall and they start laughing at the, at the park. You know what I mean? When you see they're they are playing and the, the little one fell and he is injured and is crying and they stand and they are laughing. You know, it is fun to see their fellow boy hurting. And so there are a lot of immature Christians. And so we are very happy to see another, oh, that suits him right. And then that suits her right. I knew it. I know they're not going to last. I know all those things were just a show. I know. Instead of you and I to grieve and weep and say, that is one of God's precious child. This morning, I don't have much to say. But I want to give you a charge this morning. I want to end with this. That God is calling us to a place to be different, to be perfect, to be matured, to grow in grace and in love. As many as be thou perfect, let us mind the same thing. In, uh, in chapter 2 of the same book, it said, let this mind be in you that is also in Christ. In one other scripture, the Bible says, you and I have the mind of Christ. Do you think it is the mind of Christ to see his enemies die? <laughs> Amen. 
Jesus loved everyone. He wants everyone to be saved. And so he will reach out to the, the vilest of sinner and make sure until they come back home. Jesus left his throne in glory and so came to suffer because maturity, what? Would choose suffering over comfort, over pleasure. And so all this pleasure reading gospel that has come to misdirect our focus is not from God. And so when you're suffering, they say, oh, maybe you have done something wrong. You are sin. You know what I mean? Oh, if you, if you pray and God didn't give it, you don't get it. Oh, maybe because you've done something wrong or because you don't have enough faith. Oh, please spare me. And then you look, look around and see the people who don't come to church and they are having it good. And they don't pray like you and I pray. They don't believe like you and I believe. And then, be, then it becomes more of a contradiction. Because it's not about here. It's more about there. God is more interested in eternity than here. You see, anyone that will live godly in Christ must suffer persecution. You see, it has been granted unto you not only to believe in him, but to also suffer for him. Since when suffering became a sin in the body of Christ? I'll tell you when, but I will say it now. <laughs> Amen. That your suffering is not an indictment against you. It's not because you've done something wrong. Matured Christians will choose the way of the cross. But the enemies of the cross <coughs> want nothing but pleasure. But I want to dare you this afternoon. I want to challenge you as we begin to round up this year. I want to dare you to be different. I want to dare you to withdraw your vote from the changing world and popular opinions of men and dare to be different. <coughs> I want to dare you to be the salt in a world filled with bitterness and anger. I want to dare you to be the voice of truth in a world filled with lies and deception. I want to dare you as a mature Christian this morning to be the voice to the voiceless. I want to dare you to be the picture of integrity in a world filled with deceptions. I want to dare you to be the bold one in a world filled with weak and compromising Christians. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to dare you to be the beacon of hope in a world filled with hopelessness. I want to dare you to be a giver of joy in this world filled with misery and pain. I want to dare you to be different. I want to dare you to be the kind one in a world filled with wickedness. I want to dare you as a mature Christian this afternoon to be the selfless one in a world filled with selfishness and greed. I want to dare you to be the giver in a world filled with stinginess and self-seeking people who are minding nothing but this earth. I want to dare you, my church Christians, to be the peacemaker in a world filled with revenge and vengeful people. I want to dare you to be the light in the midst of the darkness that filled this world. In this Christmas season, as we see the Christmas light, I want you to be that light to your dark world, to your neighbor, to your family. I want to dare you to be righteous in the midst of unrighteousness. I want to dare you to be holy in the midst of unholiness. I want to dare you to be the Joseph in a world filled with Pontifar's wife. I want to dare you to be the Moses in a world filled with the Pharaohs of this world. I want to dare you to be the Joshua and Caleb in a world filled with cowards who dare not confront the enemy. I want to dare you to be the David in the world filled with King Saul's of our days. I want to dare you to be the Ruth who would take the ways of suffering instead of the offers of this world who would turn their back when confronted with challenges. I want to dare you to be the Elijah in a world filled with Ahab and Jezebel's of our time. I want you, and I want to dare you, my church Christians, this morning, 
to be the Barnabas in a world filled with Ananias and Sapphiras of this world. And I want to dare you to be the John the Baptist of our time, a voice crying in the wilderness when this world is full, in a world filled with the heroes of this world. I want to dare you to be the answer in a world filled with many unanswered questions on the altar of men's heart. I want to dare you to be the hope in this world. I want to dare you to stand for truth and for righteousness. I want to dare you to be the noble, to take the noble part of humility and kindness. I want to dare you to be true agent of change in this time and season. Like the Bible says, as I conclude this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not unclean things, and I'll be your God. God is saying, come up, and come out. Dare to be different. Dare to be matured. Dare to be a good child of God. Dare to be a light that will shine brighter than the moon and the stars over our head this coming Christmas season. Shall we all stand up this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Father, we thank you this morning. We give you all the praise and we give you all the glory. We ask, O oh God, for the grace and the strength to stand tall in the midst of all the evil that is in this world. Help us, O oh God, to be a true representation of the kingdom of Christ in these last days. My Father, my God, Lord, as the season of light approaches, the Bible says, for the people who sat in darkness, behold a great light. Father God, may we be a representation of the light of the kingdom of Christ to our community, to our family this Christmas season. Give us the grace to stand in maturity that we would choose the way of the cross over the pleasures of this world. Father God, I know it is not easy. But with my brothers and my sisters, as we hold each other's hand and hold each other accountable in love, as we encourage each other, refusing to let go of each other's hand and say, you may be down right now, but I'm not going to leave you. I will come to the